Hello, I'm Melissa Heitman. I'm a post-COVID physician and respiratory physician. I lead a post-COVID service at University College London Hospital, and I'm working with the NHSE Long COVID programme as one of two national specialty advisors, together with my colleague Graham Burns. I'm very sorry that I'm not here in person with you today. What I want to uh, talk about is a uh, long COVID and how we are supporting uh, patients with recovery and how services are developing. The definition of um, long COVID has been uh, come through from NICE and has been uh, broken down according to the duration of symptoms after the initial infection. So if symptoms last um, beyond four weeks and up to 12 weeks, it's termed ongoing symptomatic COVID-19. Uh, and for symptoms beyond 12 weeks, uh, described as post-COVID syndrome. And the uh, patient preferred term of long COVID uh, encompasses that entire duration. Long COVID is uh, obviously something we uh, did not expect to see uh, at, at quite the, the levels we, we are seeing. And uh, the Office of National Statistics COVID infection survey suggests that numbers continue to um, gradually increase. So at the end of January, uh, it was estimated that 1.5 million people living in private households in the UK uh, had self-reported long COVID symptoms uh, and approximately 685,000 uh, of those with symptoms lasting beyond 12 months. Uh, fortunately, it looks as though vaccine is, uh, vaccines are protective um, and there's ONS report 41% reduced risk of long COVID symptoms if you'd had two vaccines before uh, an infection. Uh, the precise impact of Omicron and long COVID is still being evaluated. Um, there is likely to be some data coming through from the Zoe app uh, imminently and ONS are looking at this. Also, uh, we hope the incidence will be lower and that the uh, symptoms might be uh, less long lasting, but we do need to, to wait and see. The NHS in England um, responded quickly to the long COVID emergency and developed um, a plan in uh, and funding in 2020, uh, which was based around a five point plan. And then in the last financial year, we've been working to a 10 point, point plan. And this is um, very much focused about establishing post COVID services with a mechanism for assessment and rehabilitation of, of patients, uh, development of a learning network. Uh, of self-management uh, support tools and of a central NHS England registry of all patients seen in these services um, so that we can understand access to them, uh, ensure that that's equitable and model the ongoing need. There's also um, uh, been 15 hubs for children uh, with long COVID symptoms established around the country. Uh, and there was an, an investment in primary care to encourage coding of long COVID and uh, use of the new post-COVID pathway. There are 90 clinics now across the cl uh, across the England with every region um, now being served by one um, so that every GP should be able to refer into these services if appropriate. Uh, and this is the distribution of the paediatric um, hubs uh, where general paediatricians can refer into uh, post-COVID uh, specialist services. An integrated pathway is being proposed, which uh, aims for early self-management support and community-based uh, care where possible, uh, but, but ensures access to dedicated post-COVID services when necessary uh, with links with post-COVID re rehabilitation, given that there's a large need for, for that in terms of supporting recovery. I'm not going to take you through this complicated diagram, and this is something that continues to evolve as we uh, model the, the most successful uh, pathway for these patients. From our own experience at UCLH, um, setting up a post-COVID service was an emergency response back in May 2020. Um, and we started in the, the back of a mobile unit outside the hospital because outpatients were shut. Um, from that, um, the, the clinical activity was um, very, very busy and uh, the service evolved so that it now um, serves our integrated care system and our five uh, catchment boroughs. And we have um, an integrated pathway 
between the post-COVID service clinic, if you, if you call it that, and the community post-COVID pathway. Um, now, obviously, at the start, we didn't know what long COVID was, how to assess and investigate and treat it. So we have been very much building the plane as we fly it. And um, I think, you know, a lot of the best evidence is coming from the actual clinical services around the country. Uh, that's where the, the quickest learning is happening, uh, working with patients who have a clinically validated diagnosis of long COVID. Uh, and I think we've all learned around the country that the multidisciplinary team uh, is essential to these services. Um, I'm talking about physiotherapists, occupational therapists, psychologists, nurses, speech and language therapists, nutritionalists, voluntary sector workers, uh, vocational rehab. There's a long list. Um, and that's really because it's a complex condition um, to meet the biopsychosocial needs of, of the patient. You need a broad skill set uh, to, to wrap around them. We have noticed in our area there is um, very variable referral rates uh, by different uh, GPs and different levels of coding in primary care. And we're continuing to sort of track the equity of access and consider how we could improve our reach to vulnerable uh, communities or, or vulnerable patients uh, who might not be getting referred at the moment. Um, the intention has always been to co-design uh, the post-COVID pathways with patients. That's absolutely essential. Um, and we have tried to communicate and, uh, to the system how the pathway works and train and support uh, other providers. And there's an, obviously an ongoing need to do that. Um, the goal is always to provide personalised care for patients. Um, ensure we're giving good self-management support and to provide a, a model that integrates their physical and psychological health needs. There's a lot of ongoing questions. Uh, we still need to know more about what the natural history of long COVID is. And there's some uh, helpful epidemiological studies which have, have started to answer this question and continue to address it. We also need to understand what are the outcomes from these services? How are we contributing to improved recovery? Uh, what are the elements which seem to be most important? Uh, we need to know what does a good referral rate look like what proportion of patients with self-reported long COVID do actually benefit from access to the pathway versus managing um, things with, with advice and support? Uh, we need to know what, what, are, what are the clinics doing? What tests are they doing? Uh, who do they refer to? You know, what are the uh, costs of this pathway so we can um, ensure provision of it going forward? Uh, and there's definitely a need, as I said, to do proactive case finding uh, in areas where there's an unexpectedly low uh, referral rate uh, with, with long COVID. Um, we also need to know what, how do the needs of um, patients who've been discharged from hospital versus those who had COVID in the community managed. Uh, in the clinic, it feels like those needs are quite different. Um, we need to understand what competencies our workforce needs, how can we transfer skills between us to build the most efficient model, uh, how do we discharge patients effectively from our pathway, uh, and what should be the model for 23-24, uh, and are there any, is there any learning we can do from management of other long-term conditions, for example, uh, and, and how could we test out new approaches and innovate in the long COVID pathway, which might bring benefits to other patients. At UCLH, we've seen about 4,000 adults now um, since May 2020. Uh, patients are asked to do a preclinic questionnaire which, uh, where they screen their symptoms. Um, and we found that the uh, data was much more complete when we asked patients to do this themselves than when we tried to document it during a consultation. Uh, and you can see that fatigue and breathlessness are, are really very dominating symptoms in long COVID, but there are many others. And this is a multi-system um, condition. Um, and some of the symptoms are you know, extremely intrusive. Uh, people really struggle with, for example, poor sleep, palpitations, cognitive effects, um, pain, um, and uh, trying to, to draw a sort of... a a management plan for all these components is what we've been trying to get to grips with. And we've come up with this concept of treatable traits. So trying to define uh, little sub phenotypes within a long COVID presentation uh, and uh, develop a management plan for those. Um, fatigue and disordered breathing pattern are particularly 
common, uh, but we also need to um, identify other factors. So we uh, do sometimes need to investigate for post-COVID interstitial changes in on CT imaging. Uh, we have some patients who do have um, venous thromboembolic disease, more common in post-hospital patients. Uh, there's been controversy over whether myocarditis is contributing to chest pain in some patients. Uh, some have triggered asthma, but it's not the most common reason for breathlessness. Uh, the cognitive effects I've mentioned, migraine, tachycardias are extremely common, particularly exertional tachycardias and sometimes postural. Uh, so it, it's complicated. Um, it doesn't sit comfortably within the specialism of, of uh, any one sort of uh, medical specialty. And uh, we're very much working with our general physician hats on uh, in this clinic. And um, don't worry, I won't take you through this flow diagram, um, but we have, this is just to show that we've, we've tried to work out an approach through consensus whilst we wait for a, a more robust evidence base about how we should be investigating and managing patients. And this flow chart changes every month as we refine our thinking. And it's really important that we get together with other post-COVID services um, frequently uh, to, to share approaches and, and learn from other people's success as well. I mentioned that before patients come to clinic, they, they do a screening assessment, which documents their symptoms, the impact on them functionally, uh, and also notes the trends um, in whether they're getting better uh, or, or, or not improving. Um, we do this via a patient portal, and there's been a number of really useful digital tools uh, developed which other sites are using, such as this um, product by Aleros, which is a company um, working with uh, Leeds uh, and Dr. Manoj Sivan, and that's the C19 Yorkshire Rehab screening tool. Uh, and there are other examples. And I think having a breadth of experience with different tools is definitely helpful to the field. Uh, these tools do help save time within a consultation and they improve the accuracy of your uh, starting information, um, save a little bit of energy for the patient so you don't have to do too much in one day. Obviously, we need solutions for patients who are not uh, digitally enabled. Um, and what the preclinic assessment can do is allow you to triage the most appropriate support um, and sort of destination of care for an individual. I think triage is best if it's clinician led because it's complex. Um, first decision is, is the post-COVID clinic the right destination or would, should they be actually referred um, to another service? If patients have very mild symptoms and still functioning well, it may be that providing self-management advice uh, would be enough um, and then asking the GP to continue to track their progress. If patients, um, are more unwell, have severe presentations such as difficulty with working activities of daily living. Um, we have a low threshold to, to accept the referral into the clinic and we try not to reject any uh, um, reject referrals without some sort of intervention. Um, another good reason to come um, to the clinic would be if there's any diagnostic uncertainty or if it was quite clear that that patient needed further assessment to um, confirm the diagnosis and ensure their safety for post-COVID rehabilitation. Um, obviously, the rehabilitation teams worry about exertional chest pain and dizziness, for example. For patients who have a moderate severity and without red flags, um, we do consider community-based assessment, which is doctor-supported, um, and we have an integrated pathway with community meetings, MDT meetings, um, so that those patients can come through to the dedicated clinic if needed. And the goal is really trying to maximise efficiency through the pathway. We have a target of seeing patients with six weeks, which I think a lot of clinics struggle with, given uh, the busyness of the NHS at the moment. In the clinic assessment, um, in our clinic, patients spend 30 minutes with a doctor and 30 minutes with the physiotherapist or occupational therapist, and then a psychologist if needed. Um, and as I mentioned, the goal is to affirm the diagnosis and experience and pattern recognition are really important here. Not everything is long COVID and one in 20 patients we see have another important diagnosis. We are trying to get to grips with biomarkers, which has been challenging because it's such a heterogeneous condition. Um, but there are some important things that we're following and we hope to be um, 
submitting for publication soon. The assessment includes a, a brief exercise test, either a walk test or a sit stand test. Uh, we note blood pressure, heart rate, and uh, we do an active lean test if there's concern about postural symptoms. Same day testing for ECG, chest x-ray, CT and echo if needed. We're trying not to overuse those investigations as we've learned more about when they are likely to be abnormal uh, because certainly the majority of these will be normal in a non-hospitalised patient. Uh, the aim is to generate a therapy prescription and, and what are the ongoing needs of that individual and to try and manage um, the various components of their long COVID as best as possible. We need to continue to monitor their progress and um, find solutions to manage the, the fluctuating nature of, um, COVID, of long COVID. So we use um, PIFU patient initiated follow up uh, quite often so that patients can access the pathway again. In terms of post-COVID rehab, this really does need to be multifaceted, um, particularly uh, important uh, developing approaches to managing fatigue and patients will be taught about the boom bust cycle of fatigue. Um, disordered breathing pattern is very common and there's important respiratory physiotherapy intervention that can really improve symptoms and uh, a lovely offer from the voluntary sector with English National Opera offering a, a course to help patients retrain their breathing pattern. Um, vocational rehab, physical rehab with reconditioning and appropriate uh, exercise for that individual is also uh, being increasingly shown to be beneficial, um, always personalised and, um, my, and, and mindful to watch out that you're not getting post-exertional symptom exacerbation um, and adjusting uh, accordingly. Psychology is very um, important um, really to any um, uh, important medical condition, as we all know. Uh, and there's an increasing interest in post-COVID teams being trained in personalised care approaches. And we had a, a brilliant coaching session at UCH uh, last week. I, I can see that's going to be really helpful to us. Self-management support. There's an NHS supported website, Your COVID Recovery, uh, a number of digital apps, uh, group um, consultations and um, mechanisms for peer support are proving really helpful uh, and ongoing ways to, to monitor patients' recovery um, it is something that we're seeing helpful also. And our patients come to clinic um, often very afraid. Um, they uh, are very fearful that they, that they will never recover uh, and that COVID has ruined their life or things that will never be the same again. These are the sort of things that they say to us. And I think um, what, what we can be is emphatic in, in saying, actually, no, long COVID is something that you can recover from. Um, we see some people um, get complete resolution of symptoms. Uh, and although that improvement can feel very slow for some people, we do see a benefit with a proactive um, approach to, to rehabilitation and trying to manage uh, uh, their illness. So um, it's about trying to be open and explaining the condition, explaining what we know uh, and how we think we can treat it effectively. And um, I mentioned MDT meetings quite often. Um, they're really important to our service, both um, the community-based MDTs and then the multi-specialty-based MDT at UCLH. Um, and this has allowed us to learn rapidly together, um, identify opportunities to improve management, avoid multiple appointments and multiple waiting lists, hopefully. Um, and really just sort of develop strong relationships so that we can hold a patient across this quite complicated pathway as effectively as possible. And obviously we have not got that perfect at the moment. Very grateful to a large number of colleagues who work in our hospital. All the ologies have contributed to our learning about long COVID. Um, and, uh, you know, they have given generously of their time. We, we have some funded time specifically for cardiology and neurology because there's been such a need to ask questions of them. Obviously, everybody wants to know what's the cause of long COVID, and there's been some um, important and compelling hypotheses um, described. I think we're still waiting for uh, a, a more robust evidence base on all the all, all of the theories that have been put forward, but they are autoimmunity, viral persistence, mitochondrial effects, and then increasingly there's been huge patient interest in a, in a publication which was describing the presence of micro clots in a very small series of patients. And this is something that I think there's definitely more research uh, needed on before we uh, overinterpret that very small series that's been described. Uh, 
Same goes for treatments. There's, um, you know, growing um, preprint and and small published series about uh, quite radical treatment approaches for long COVID. And um, these often, um, these case series often at this early stage lack a control group. And I think there remains huge uncertainty about their validity in clinical practice, uh, but our patients come asking about hyperbaric oxygen, uh, health apheresis, uh, full anticoagulation and antihistamines. And we have um, occasionally used anticoagulation and antihistamines according to clinical judgment. Um, but fortunately, there, there, there should be an improving evidence base with some uh, NIHR funded studies where um, there's actually going to in- include a medicines trial component for long COVID patients. NICE are running uh, what they call a living guideline on managing the effects of COVID-19 and do regular evidence reviews. And I think if a treatment has not been endorsed by the NICE guidance, uh, we should think very carefully before using it outside of a clinical trial. In terms of diagnostics, um, at UCLH, most patients would have a chest X-ray and bloods, um, and the screening bloods are really to look for other causes of fatigue. And it's an important opportunity to do some health screening. Um, you know, picking we've picked up a lot of people with hyperlipidemia and hypertension, uh, which needs management. Um, in the first year, we did quite a lot of CT thorax scans trying to understand this slightly odd breathlessness that you see in long COVID. And I think we do those less often. Lung function, obviously a safer test test for patients. And I think it's going to be increasingly important in us trying to define um, certain subgroups of, of patients who have a, a lung function abnormality underlying their breathlessness. Um, but, but overall, I wouldn't say that that's particularly common. Echo, we used to do very, very often and now much less. Um, Halter we're still doing quite often because we find it helpful in guiding our management of post-COVID tachycardia. Um, But we're not looking for arrhythmia. We're trying to define the burden of inappropriate sinus tachycardia in those patients. Uh, There's other fancy tests done occasionally, such as looking for autonomic dysfunction, which we have not often found. Um, MRI brain, again, generally normal. Cardiac MRI, quite controversial. I'll talk about that. Um, And nerve conduction studies, again, Uh, Only very rarely do we find a definable abnormality or neurophysiology, but patients can get very weird, aching, pain, tingling. In terms of onward referrals, um, about half of our patients need follow up within the clinic because they're complicated. Uh, We're referring a third to dedicated psychology support and over two thirds need some form of supported ongoing therapy and intervention. Uh, And about 10% are discussed with other specialties in meetings and occasionally referred to dedicated clinics uh, in, in other specialties. I think as physicians, our focus would naturally fall to um, patients who were discharged from hospital with post-COVID-19. And I think initially we assumed that that they would have by far the greatest burden of disease. And uh, in fact, you know, the the, the FOSP study, which has been led by Dr. Rachel Evans from Leicester, um, has shown uh, ongoing significant morbidity after hospital discharge. So uh, in their first paper, they showed that at six month follow up from wave one discharges, only a, a 29% felt fully recovered and 20% had a new disability, 19% had a change in occupation and risk factors for doing badly seem to be being female, uh, being middle-aged, having comorbidities and having a more severe acute illness and also an elevated CRP. Um, similar story in their preprint describing uh, outcomes at 12 months where 70% are uh, still not fully recovered. Um, and I think what we didn't expect was how quite how well, well non-hospitalized patients could also be. Um, and I think the picture is quite, quite challenging because post-hospital patients are more likely to have in measure identifiable end organ effects. But a proportion of them also have the post-viral syndrome, which is long COVID, which is more what we're seeing in the non-hospitalized group. I think at the start, we were all very worried about pulmonary fibrosis after um, a severe uh, um, COVID pneumonia. Uh, And this is is certainly identifiable, particularly in patients who had a a long period of intubation or an ARDS type phase to their illness. Um, The FOSP study has a subgroup, the UK ILD post-COVID study, uh, and they uh, are, are publishing uh, data which is showing that 
interstitial change beyond 10% abnormality on the scan is present between 5 and 11% at eight months after discharge. And we don't know what to do about this. At the moment, we're having quite a low threshold to keep these patients on our books to um, continue to follow up so that we do understand what the long-term sequelae will be. Um, Post-COVID interstitial lung change damage, uh, we haven't quite defined the term for it, is much less common in non-hospitalised patients, but um, is seen occasionally. There's good evidence that uh, lung function gas transfer is reduced after severe COVID. And there's an example review that I've given on this slide. Uh, and obviously we know PE is common in acute COVID and there's a growing interest in what are the pulmonary vascular effects and consequences uh, during the recovery of, after COVID. And um, it's been demonstrated that there's widespread microangiopathy um, if you do advanced imaging studies, um, for example, three months after hospital discharge. Uh, and we're quite intrigued by this because we have a subset of non-hospitalised patients who have abnormal gas transfer without lung parenchymal change. Um, and occasionally we've picked up non-segmental perfusion defects. We're not sure what the clinical significance of that is. We're not quite sure what the right imaging modality would be, whether that's dual energy CT, uh, VQ, perfusion scanning, or more interest, more recently, um, you may have seen some a, a small series published uh, where they're looking at the uh, role of xenon MRI of the lung to um, define post-COVID abnormalities. It's all very much in early stages. We noted um, quite early on, some of our patients have quite abnormal exercise physiology, uh, and this is particularly looking at the non-hospitalized group where we did not expect to see this because they're often previously quite fit. Um, but when you do a walk test with capillary blood gases before and after, in 12% uh, of patients, we see quite a, a, an unexpected rise in lactate after that six minute walk. Uh, and so for example, in this patient, lactate going up to 6.9. Uh, I'm not sure if that could just be deconditioning. Could it be contributing as the drive to um, the breathlessness that we see in long COVID? We haven't had a lot of success doing CPEP testing because patients find them difficult to tolerate due to dizziness and post-exertional symptoms uh, flaring up after CPEP. So I think some further dedicated studies are needed here. And we have uh, one at UCLH uh, looking more deeply into the effects on muscle and, and uh, mitochondria. Post-COVID cardiology um, was something um, that I think also took us a little bit by surprise. So I, I would say, first of all, if you're in a post-COVID clinic, find a friendly cardiologist because the cardiology is quite hard. Um, the chest pain is a common symptom. Uh, it can be quite atypical in nature. Some people have quite an obvious costochondritis pattern, but we also see patients with disconcerting exertional chest pain, which does sound quite anginal. Um, and we've had discussions about the potential microvascular angina playing a role. ECHO hasn't um, been particularly helpful, and certainly in the non-hospitalized group. We did do quite a lot of cardiac MRIs initially and were surprised that 25% were reported to have um, some small levels of abnormalities, but there's quite a lot of controversy over this reporting um, of small areas of late gadolinium enhancement and what their clinical significance is uh, and whether that might actually be a normal finding in health. So um, I, I definitely don't get involved in the discussions about the CMR reporting, uh, but, but as I understand it, the changes are not as evident as they are in, in the picture that I um, took uh, top right um, from online. I didn't dare show one of our, our patient scans and open up a, a can of worms. Um, so I think that's something that cardiologists are con continuing to work through. Uh, we do see improved symptoms with colchicine, and that's one of the uh, drugs that is being evaluated in the Stimulate ICP uh, NIHR funded study. Palpitations, I've said, are very common. Uh, we do see uh, in quite frequently inappropriate sinus tachycardia with um, mean heart rates uh, above 90. Uh, we have, um, in terms of managing this, some, some success with the, the lifestyle advice given to patients with POTS, um, but sometimes that isn't very helpful. And increasingly, we've been using evabradine for rate control for symptomatic improvement when people are really struggling with that sinus tachycardia. So what does a, a post-COVID service add? I, I've just tried to give you a bit of a flavour of all the different things we're trying to get to grips with and improve our approaches in. And I think it, it demonstrates that these services are a, a useful starting point for this emergent 
condition. Um, the patients are very unwell. Um, demand for the pathway is, is high, uh, with 5,000 patients being seen across England um, every month by services. Um, but it's important that the, the, that the clinic um, is not something that works in isolation and that it's, um, it's very much a pathway. And it could be based in the community if it had access to appropriate diagnostics and workforce. Ours evolved uh, in a hospital setting, but we're trying to um, at least conceptually move out the hospital as much as possible. It, certainly we're functioning as a hub to establish experience and, and clinical confidence in managing this condition. Um, we provide on-site training for our, our integrated team in North Central London um, and provide some quality assurance you know, across the pathway and so that we can at least ensure we have a consistent approach. Um, one of the most important functions should be um, giving patients access to research um, and NIHR have invested uh, significant sums in two funding calls for long COVID research so far. Um, in terms of the way post-COVID clinics work, the Stimulate ICP and the locomotion studies are particularly important. So Stimulate ICP is evaluating usual care and looking at um, diagnostic approaches, including an MRI protocol. Um, and there's a medicine trial component, also looking at digital um, apps for rehabilitation. The locomotion study is evaluating long COVID care over 10 study sites and aiming to create a gold standard approach. Um, and there's many other really important and useful studies. And we, we try to keep abreast of all the, uh, the latest literature as best we can. So just to conclude, I would say we've made significant progress in establishing clinical services. There is ongoing need to model the right provision to provide training and support for the workforce, to strengthen self-management support for patients and to translate emerging evidence into more effective treatments and really continue to do those mechanistic studies. Um, we need to continue to evaluate our pathways and our approaches to know what works and what doesn't. Prevention of long COVID should remain a high priority. Uh, this is a, a horrible illness. Um, and although patients get better, they can be unwell for many months. Uh, and vaccination, uh, I think then therefore remains very important and continue, continuing to understand the effects of new variants. Uh, and I do think long COVID is an important opportunity to innovate and test out things that we've been trying to do in other disease areas for a while and really try and identify any transferable benefits to other uh, disease management, particularly of interest, uh, long-term conditions, although we hope that, that long COVID uh, will, will not be a long-term condition for the majority. Uh, and then it highlights the need to improve and expand rehabilitation services um, in the UK. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and I hope that I have not overrun too much. Uh, I am going to stop there. Thank you.